Our next speaker, Tony Dahlman, will be speaking from the uh, for a project in the Advanced Communicator Manual, Humorously Speaking, project number three, Make Them Laugh. Make Them Laugh. Tony Dahlman, an ode to lecterns. An ode to lecterns. Tony Dahlman. <laughs> Mr. Toastmaster of the day, fellow Toastmasters and honored guests, my youngest nephew Dawson uh, likes uh, telling me a lot of jokes and uh, one of his favorite types of jokes is the armless legless man joke and if you're not familiar with how the format goes, it's, I'll give you a couple examples. Uh, what do you call an armless legless man hanging on the wall? You call him Art. Oh, no. What do you call an almost legless man out in the middle of a lake? We call him Bob. <laughs> so, Dawson, knowing that I'm that I enjoy speaking, he goes, well, "Tony, what do you call an almost legless man on top of a lectern?" Well, you call him Mike. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> well, since since I don't know if my comedy is that good, we're going to move on to doing a little bit of history instead. So I'm going to show you some pictures of some famous speeches, and if you know what the person is or the speech is, uh, feel free to jump in and tell who it is. We'll go to our first picture here. Uh, does everybody know who this is? Martin Luther King Jr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his I Have a Dream speech in 1963. Okay, uh, next picture. This is uh, John F. Kennedy doing his inaugural address in 1963, the Ask Not What You Can Do for Your Country. And 1961, that is correct, sorry. Okay, next picture. FDR. This is FDR. Uh, he gave this in December 8th, 1941, the day after, the day which will live in infamy. And our, next, and our last one. Ronald Reagan, Berlin Wall. Uh, Ronald Reagan at the Brandenburg Gate of the Berlin Wall in 1987, where he told Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. So out of these four pictures, what did these four pictures have in common? Mm -hmm. They all used a lectern. They all used a lectern is absolutely correct. <laughs> <laughs> there are, it's, all Toastmasters clubs are different, and I knew that when I moved from South Dakota to Washington, D.C. But one thing that I absolutely noticed when I joined USDA Toastmasters is how much this club tells you to get rid of the lectern. So that is why today I have decided to go completely the other way, and I am giving an ode to lecterns. And to do that, we're going to look at three main areas. Number one, we're going to look at some different lectern facts. Number two, we're going to look at some tips for using the lectern. And then number three, we're going to look at how the lectern relates to some of the unwritten rules of Toastmasters. First area we're going to look at is lectern facts. I know I have been letting this known, but uh, during my freshman year in college, I conducted a failed experiment which was known as taking two semesters of Latin. And despite the D plus and the D that I got in those two semesters and the conscious effort that I made to completely try and forget all Latin facts, some of it has still uh, remained in my mind. Lectern comes from the Latin root lectus, which is the past participle of to read in Latin. That is why we get the word for lectern, that a lectern helps us to read. It is also the same root that we get lecture from. So basically, a lectern helps us to read. Traditionally, lecterns have been used to hold religious texts, uh, most commonly the Christian Bible or the Jewish Torah. So basically, it's, uh, was a, it was a stand with a slanted top that would allow you to help you to read. Today, the lectern has many, many different uses outside of the religious sense, and basically, it is any reading desk with a slanted top. A lectern can be something like we use in our club, something that sits on top of a table, or we have another example of a lectern back here that goes all the way to the floor. And lecterns can be uh, very plain, they can just be a couple of metal, uh, pieces of metal, like what you would see in a music stand, or it can be as ornate as what you would see in the rostrum in the United States House of Representatives. So lectern goes back way, it goes back far in time, and it has many different uses, but it allows us it helps us to read and it helps us in our lectures that we give in our everyday lives. So now that we know a little bit about the lectern, I wanted to share with you some tips for using the lectern. Now, I still get chills in my spine when I think about my mock trial coach in high school yelling at me 
for using the lectern during one of our competition trials when I was in high school. The mock, tri the mock trial coach, just like uh, Pete Martinez, tells us that a lectern provides a barrier between you and your audience, and that is why you should take that away. But I think that there are some very, that there are some good instances where you should be using a lectern. Number one, you should be using a lectern if you have notes. The only reason why you take the lectern away is that if your speech is completely memorized or that if you're able to hold the notes in your hand. I've seen many instances in our club where somebody has come up to the front of the table, gotten rid of the lectern, and has, but yet still brings up a couple of crumpled sheets of paper. The lectern is able to hide your notes and is able, and so therefore you are able to have a much more professional look. A lot of times, lecterns also have technology built in them, whether it's a microphone or whether it's uh, some type of way that you can control your electronic media that you're using in your speeches. So basically, there are a lot of cases where you are going to need to use a lectern. So it's important for us in Toastmasters to practice using a lectern to make sure we are using it effectively. You also want to make sure that you don't grab onto the lectern. Even though it feels natural to you when you're up here, it feels unnatural to your, to your audience. So you want to make sure, just try to avoid touching the lectern at all. You don't want to be leaning over the lectern. This gives an aggressive view to the audience. You want to back away from it and allow the audience to see the gestures that you're using. So even though the, gesture, the lectern does have some of its down points, it's, uh, it can be an effective use in some different ways. So the third and final area we're going to look at is how the lectern relates to the unwritten rule of Toastmasters. There is the lectern versus podium debate. Going back to the Latin, podium comes from the Latin root for pod, which means foot. And a podium is actually a stand that you stand on and not something that you speak behind. Even though many dictionaries say that these words are actually uh, can be used uh, in, in use of each other, Actually, there is a major difference between a lectern and a podium, and you're going to find a lot of Toastmasters who are not going to be shy about telling you this. <clears throat> There's also the rule about leaving the do not leaving the lectern unattended. While I've generally only seen this in Toastmasters meetings, it's definitely a good rule to have so that you can make sure that your meeting goes smoothly and that your audience doesn't have a break in anything that you do. So today we have looked at three areas. Number one, lectern facts. Number two, some tips for using the lectern. And number three, some of the unwritten rule of Toastmasters. So today I hope I have told you some different ways that you can use, uh, use a lectern and the different ways that it can be used effectively. So I will close with another joke from my nephew Dawson. What do you call a lectern that eats people? Oh. Hannibal lectern. <laughs> 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 Mr. Post